that. Okay, perfect. Uh, great. Well, I think I gave a quick intro to the first meeting, but just to introduce myself since we have so many new people here. Uh, my name is Corey. I work at Klarna. Uh, not, unfortunately, not in AI at the moment. Uh, primarily working on the integrations to different uh, shop systems and payment service providers. Uh, but I'm definitely falling square in the uh, volunteering, hoping that uh, from presenting this stuff that we can get like a better understanding together on some of these machine learning concepts. So not necessarily an expert here, but uh, happy to share kind of what I've found so far. And what we're going to talk about as the sort of title of this event is, is uh, what is a GAN? Uh, so if you don't know anything about GANs, you've come to the right place. And hopefully, if you do know a lot about GANs, uh, I can at least show some things that maybe you haven't discovered lately in the past or some new concepts because the world of GANs is kind of ever-changing, it seems. So as uh, Anzen mentioned, we've already seen this man's face <laughs> already tonight, but uh, Yen LeCun, he is obviously very super excited about GANs. And I, I put the both these quotes up here because I thought it was funny because one says uh, this is the most interesting idea in the last 10 years, and then he was also in quote saying it's the coolest idea in the last 20 years. So obviously this is it's a very exciting field of machine learning, and Yan is uh, definitely uh, excited for it. Uh, so if anything, I guess the main goal for tonight is I, I want everyone to sort of share in that excitement and uh, be like Yan. So even if you haven't heard anything about uh, GANs before, or if you have already and you've kind of made, you know, maybe it's not an interesting space for you, I hope at least some of the things that I shared to you tonight uh, will get you excited about what GANs can do, because uh, it's a quite interesting field of machine learning. So a little bit about the history of GANs. So this is the, the GAN father, just to continue more of the gangster references. I don't know if Ian calls himself uh, the GAN father or if that's just something that media has labeled. Uh, but a little bit about him. Uh, so what really he kind of did from a problem solution pr perspective was we had in machine learning generative networks before where they could generate images, but those images were actually quite crap as far as what you could see or the quality of them. Uh, so in a bar, as most great decisions happen, one of his colleagues came and presented him this problem. Uh, and then the same night of, and this is obviously the, the myth or the legend, uh, he came, he went home and coded a way to present having two competing generative networks and what that actually uh, can yield as far as output in comparison to one generative network, uh, which is one of the big things, I think, uh, going into this is so special, I think, about GANs in comparison to them, other networks. So what, it, what really is all of the hype about? Why is everyone kind of excited in the last five years, I guess, in machine learning? Um, Really, if you look, break it down, break down the generative, or again, being a generative network, first and foremost is that the, if, we, if you look at the two sort of distinct or different types of uh, algorithms or networks that we go deal with in machine learning, first we have the discriminative algorithms, which I think most people are sort of used to, or if you see machine learning in the media, that's normally what's happening. So it takes features of a, a certain data uh, and pro provides labels to them. So you can think of like uh, an email filter is saying spam or not spam based on uh, the ways the subject matter, the subject title, or what it looks like or wh where it's coming from, the, the recipient. So in, in mathematical terms, it's taking, given the probability of Y, uh, what is X or the output of X. Where generative algorithms are quite different. It actually takes labels um, that's provided uh, and uh, it, it then provides, or labels based on the actual features of uh, what it sees in the data. So instead of um, producing, uh, you know, having data with a bunch of tails, you can say, okay, this is a dog, and rather than uh, having, looking at spam or not spam. So it's saying, take given the probability of X, uh, given Y. So it's really asking the question of how do we get to X uh, in a generative uh, algorithm or a generative network. Uh, and then the other crucial part of a GAN is the adversarial part. So like I said, the main concept is we had generative networks and they were working fine, uh, but they just weren't really producing convincing images. Uh, now, we if you want to make them produce better uh, images, we, we present an opponent. So the classic kind of example I, I saw 
uh, really about how to explain the adversarial was uh, forging dollars or for forging currencies or for forging um, artwork. So I kind of just twisted it a little bit just to make it a little special, but it's really the idea of, okay, how do we make something fake uh, and convince uh, another network that it's actually real? And so in this case of scenario, I say, you know, how do we sort of make the best fake ticket? Let's say we're trying to get into a stadium or a concert. Uh, we want to not actually pay, but use a, uh, a generative network to do, to do so. So the two main concepts uh, is that there's a generator network, which is you being the individual that wants to actually make the fake ticket. And then there's a, there's a discriminator network being, in this example, sort of the stadium security or whoever's checking the tickets. Uh, so those are the two sort of main concepts of how uh, we take two neural networks and compete uh, making the best or uh, allowing the generative network to actually fool uh, the discriminator network. So looking more specifically around the generator network, first the input that you're actually presenting the generator network is just actually random noise, which gets represented by Z uh, in most uh, representations or most formulas. Uh, the action that actually takes from the generator network is that it's actually the goal really is to generate as many different images as possible. So it's not actually focusing on the producing the perfect image. Uh, it's actually just the output really is focusing on how can I produce the most amount of what I can present to the discriminator uh, to convince it or fool it and learn from that actual feedback loop uh, uh, presenting to the discriminator, discriminator network. And the goal, obviously, is then to then fool the discriminator, to present the fake ticket, and to get into the concert. And that's actually getting gets presented as uh, D of G of, of Z. Uh, so G being the, the output of the, uh, the generator network, and D being uh, the sort of function of the actual discriminator. So the, when it, that was sort of the output is turned to 1, then we know that we've sort of hit a real ticket. The discriminator network, uh, it's a little bit different. So it, its actual main input is training data. So the training data being real tickets or real images. Uh, so it knows exactly what that is, which normally gets represented as D of X. Uh, and then the action is that now it takes two different data streams. It takes one being the data set that we are the training set uh, of real tickets or real images, as well as the generator data set, which we're taking in uh, to compare that actual uh, data that it's receiving from the, the generator. So the goal here is really to labeling uh, the output of the generator to fake. So that's its main reason for being, uh, is to present something zero. Uh, so D of G of Z being uh, actually a fake ticket. So this is kind of just a, a brief overlook of, uh, or outlook of um, the architecture of being there. So we have the random noise that goes into or being fed to the generator to produce the fake image, and then we have the training data, data set that we know of real images. Those both go into the discriminator network uh, and then present real or fake uh, based on uh, in its comparison of the, the two uh, inputs there. Uh, and then this is directly from sort of the, the original paper uh, by Ian Goodfellow, uh, but again, really just sort of explaining the, the process of taking X uh, with the sample data using uh, the function of D and then tr the discriminator trying to push this to one being um, or either tries to have it actually uh, zero because uh, it wants to be a fake. And then going also back to the generator, which is the input of Z, using that function, sampling that from X, uh, and then looking at the answer of D of G being zer near zero or D of G being near one. Yep, what, how can I help? <laughs> so is <laughs> zero the fake and one the real or what? Uh, yeah, zero is fake okay. and one is real. Okay, so one is then <laughs> the discriminator is not. Yeah, uh, the generator is, yes. And the, the discriminator is pushing to make it zero. Uh, so the idea here, I think, if I, uh, is that the end goal here is one uh, that uh, as far as the training is that you either want obviously the generator to uh, or the discriminator to push it to one saying it's a real ticket uh, but when you know that you've kind of hit the sweet spot is when uh, the discriminator is actually returning things like 0.5 or 50 it's a 50 50 shot that the discriminator is saying I don't know if this is real or fake so I'm just kind of guessing 
through the whole process. Uh, and technically, um, you can also, at that point, remove the discriminator network at all uh, because there's no function for it to be there if it's not <laughs> producing anything of value. And then now the generator network can kind of take over and you can present uh, the noise or to the generator network and then the output desired being a fake ticket can be produced. Uh, so that's kind of ultimately where you, where you want to be at when uh, designing a GAN or how to actually produce uh, a functioning GAN. And this is uh, also called sort of in game theory the Nash equilibrium, uh, which is, I'll go into a little bit more about uh, how to train networks, and this is uh, really, really difficult to get to in most cases. Uh, but it's really that uh, to the point that, you know, the generator is really trying to maximize uh, the final classification error. So that meaning that the, gener the discriminator doesn't is making errors on actually the call, but on what the output is. But it's actually making the, the ideal uh, result, which is producing something saying it's uh, a real, even though it's a fake. And then the discriminator is mi trying to minimize this error. So this is in game theory is called a min-max game. So if uh, you do any inter independent research on this, you will probably see a lot of that, those references there. Um, and then this is kind of how it's represented in the functions. Uh, the discriminator out output being the real data, uh, and then the generated fake data uh, that I mentioned, which is G of Z. So some training challenges. So one of the things that, I mean, GANs are quite like new-ish, uh, and it's one of the biggest cons of using GANs for anything is that they're really hard to get that equilibrium, and there's a lot of times if you don't get it, then it's quite useless to uh, to use. So one of the issues, obviously, is that if the discriminator is too easy to fool. Uh, so this is a, a two-headed chipmunk, and it was produced by a GAN that uh, the discriminator, looking at the parameters and looking at this, uh, it was just too easy and thought this was actually a real chipmunk. Um, so, I mean, maybe in some worlds two-headed two chipmunks <laughs> exist, uh, but this is obviously when the discriminator is too easy to fool. And then the other, obviously the flip side is uh, if the discriminator is too hard to fool. So the generator is producing uh, the noise or producing the output, and it's actually not getting the proper feedback or proper uh, any sort of loop around that from the, gen the discriminator to know how to actually improve on uh, the images there. So it's actually producing nothing. Um, and then another big one is mode collapse. So these are actually, this example here is two different GANs producing using um, a data set called minced, which is like a number data set that's quite popular to use, where it's generating actually uh, the numbers. And you can see kind of going down that this is actually supposed to look one through 10. Uh, while the other, genera the other generator, or this GAN below here, you can see is actually producing the same things over and over again. And what happens here is that the generator uh, is generating limited examples. So it finds one kind of optimal point and says, well, I'm satisfied. I can just keep on going with this um, because the discriminator has produced this as being uh, real. Um, so what should happen is that uh, the discriminator should actually identify this as what was called a collapse point. So it should detect that this is something that's getting over, re over produced over and over again, uh, and actually provide feedback onto the discriminator or to the generator that uh, it should now produce something a little bit more uh, or, or different. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh oh it's actually good more close to one uh, uh for this, but the optimal point is not only real, like one to real, but also that it should represent the data set that the discriminator is utilizing. So in this case, uh the discriminator has a data set that actually looks something close to this. So it's in the generator is producing something that's of representation of or close to the what the discriminator data set is. In this particular case, while it's getting uh, a high result, let's say close to one, it's not actually representing uh, real images. So I'll go a little bit more about different approaches to GANs, but you can say if there's a face and this is just all 
I'm like your face, for example. <laughs> like we're producing a whole bunch of faces, and it's just your face. It's a face, but it's not what we we wanted a, a group of faces. <laughs> yeah, I, it's actually coming from that things are uh, modal, like they have different variety to them. Um, I think that's where the where it's derived from. But maybe uh, when you go into the implementation stuff. Uh, you can go into a little bit more about that, um, but yeah, that's kind of where the where the, the term comes from. Um, so yeah, like I said, the discriminer should actually now give some feedback to the generator to point to other uh, different different data sets or different production or output. Uh, but the only kind of way outside of the the mode collapse, if you're kind of trapped in that and that doesn't happen, is to actually completely restart the training. Um, some other ways to get around some of the other uh, things around like the discriminator being too good or the uh, generator not being good enough is a lot of tips around training these networks in uh, alternative fashions uh, so that there is a uh, constant on the discriminator side uh, as far as actually the uh, way that you train them. And then there's a constant on the uh, generator side. So you train the generator once based on the adversary, or the constant adversary uh, being the discriminator, and then you make changes to the discriminator at work after you've made those changes. So you kind of alternate uh, so that they can kind of better themselves throughout the process. Uh, and then there's an also another kind of way to improve this. Uh, it's a, called the Wasserstein GAN, uh, or the WGAN. And um, I, to be honest, did not have enough time or energy to dedicate to talking about this, and I think it's almost like a topic on itself. Uh, but one of the big things that, uh, I or what it's kind of talked about now, is that it's improving the stability of GANs so that you don't have things like mode collapse, and you don't have things uh, like the, the, the discriminator being too strong. And the way it does it is actually it weights the ranges for actually the gradient updates. So the gradient being where, uh, how you sort of improve or change the, the training of the networks. So there's a range of that so that um, you don't change it too much or too, too little to uh, add some instability to either side of the equation, I guess. Um, and then also, it uses a thing called the Wasserstein distance, uh, which is uh, a way, which is also called an earth move resistance. And the example is around how to use the least energy or least energy to move piles of dirt around. But it's the idea that uh, how do you now make the, the easiest decisions in the smallest amount of effort, essentially. Um, and then the discriminator in this sense doesn't actually uh, present real or fake, but it actually helps point to uh, the generator in the what is called the Wasserstein distance. So it points the generator to the range of where it can make different enhancements to itself, uh, but it doesn't allow, the, it doesn't necessarily present the real or fake. Uh, so there's a paper, a huge paper there uh, that I've linked there, and then um, you can take a look at it in a little bit more detail. But that's another approach or another way that GANs are sort of improving themselves. But th I think the one of the e interesting things around GANs is just the approaches to how to use them in sort of the real world, if you, s if you speak. And I think, and what I mean by approach is kind of applications or where we've probably seen GANs uh, in the wild. So the first one is around generation. Uh, so this is uh, an image taken from uh, this person does not exist dot com. Uh, so this person is completely fake. He's never doesn't exist. Never walked the face of the earth. But I think it's you know pretty convincing on what the, that actually looks like. So this is actually using an approach called the style GAN. And the style GAN first uh, came about by kind of evolving uh, the what is called a program. And a program is short for progressive uh, generative network. So what it does is, is you can kind of see the GIF, but it takes like a four by four image. Uh, it presents that to the discriminator. If that's okay or improves, then it goes and it progresses to an eight by eight. Then it goes to a 16 by 16, 32 by 32, uh, until it can get to a pretty high quality image. Uh, and I think that it's, it ends at 1,204. Uh, so you can see kind of the progression here and also the training time it takes uh, to get that. So it's quite cool, uh, but if you notice that this is always a woman, or it's always a, uh, it's evolving into one type of woman throughout each step. So the way 
so there's a very limitation to the specific features it could it could change. She can't really change. She can't like from in the end have glasses or she can have freckles. It's still kind of progressing in in one direction based on uh, the feedback from the discriminator. So the uh, individuals behind StyleGAN wanted to find a way to be able to not only make one face or one high definition face, but multiple high definition uh, faces. So they use uh, StyleGAN, which is uh, kind of shown here, where you have a source, so kind of the the target, the source or the original uh, face based on what the discriminator network has, uh, and then different core styles uh, that can be copied from there. So if you look kind of really closely to the uh, faces, they kind of have similar elements to them, and it's using using kind of based on ProGAN, progressing the face, but then also using different uh, the different approach that StyleGAN uses, which is first it actually what they notice is when you present the initial noise into the generator or use the generator, there was some constant values uh, in the face that they could uh, actually hold and not change so that the, the faces uh, would remain the same on certain levels, but then they would change other parameters within those faces to uh, allow for modifications like the, the pose, uh, the face, the shape, and things like that. And what it comes down to is what they call adaptive instant normalization, uh, but what essentially it is is in a, uh, you can think of a neural network as different layers. Uh, there's a style layer in one neur neural network, and they actually take that style layer of that neural network and present it to uh, sort of a what's called a nor normal layer of the, the other neural network that there's uh, the generator is using. So the style is the same, but all of the other sort of hyper parameters change uh, within these faces to make them uh, quite different. And what they also found was what they do uh, they did change different accesses. They can do different hair colors, different faces, and then they also found ways where there were similarities between uh, like woman with glasses to man with glasses, but man with glasses didn't equal woman with without glasses. It's kind of a different uh, approach to sort of editing the faces there. Uh, the next kind of uh, thing that GANs can do is text uh, to image synthesis. So you can take a text uh, description and actually make an image based on that text description. And that's using a thing called StackGAN. So StackGAN uses first, uh, it actually uses two stages of GANs. First is uh, the first ga stage, GAN1, is using a concept called text embedding, which is kind of using, it's it comes from natural language processing, but it also processes the text where they can actually represent zero and one based on the text uh, that it's using. So the color could be orange could be zero and yellow could be one, things like that. Um, and then it actually then uses another uh, GAN. So the first GAN uses a text embedding as well to make a kind of rough image, which you'll see here. So they're not that great, but they kind of look like birds. Uh, the bird is black with the green and has very short beak. And then the second stage of a GAN, so using another GAN, uh, they use not uh, the first it takes not only not Z, but the output of the first GAN, as well as the text embedding uh, the that was already produced from the GAN 1. So it's kind of clever in that way that you have two GANs working together. One is using kind of the text embedding and producing rough images, and then the stage 2 uh, kind of refines the image and makes it uh, look, look a little bit better that way. Yep. So the first GAN actually works on the text to produce the image. So the actual, the discriminator first actually discriminates on the image itself. So th it knows if it's real or fake. Then the discriminator discriminates based on the text. So, um, well, in this case, you get it would discriminate twice uh, as far as based on, because what, what happens is the first stage, it's really hard to make, you can make easy to make fake images based on the text. So it first looks at images to make sure if this is a real image of a bird. Uh, and then, uh, okay, based on that, is this based on the, is it based on actually the text? Is that connecting to the image that the, 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 the generator made? So there's, that's the first level. Yeah, essentially, because there's two stages of GANs as well. Uh, now the second stage is another GAN. But it instead of, so fr a GAN takes first the uh, like random noise to make uh, the images. But 
the second GAN, instead of taking random noise to make the images, it takes the first images that the first GAN made. So then it refines that, and then it presents it to the discriminator to d also discriminate on, is this real and is this based on the text? Exactly. No worries. So the, the last one is uh, source to target or domain transfer. So what you can see here is that we have like input being a horse and you want to change the horse into a zebra or even uh, different styles of uh, doing so you have an image that's an input, uh, just a random, uh, it could be a random image and then you put that in actual styles of uh, Monet, Van Gogh, and I have no idea who those other two artists are, so but I'm sure they're famous. <laughs> So that's using CycleGAN. So CycleGAN, similar to uh, StyleGAN, what it uses first uh, a s easier uh, GAN system, which it was called Pix to Pix. I'm not sure exactly what the GAN uh, was called. I think it's CGAN, where it takes uh, CGAN or Pix to Pix was able to pair uh, one image to, or based on that image to another image. So the data, the original data set, is actually already kind of prepared. And the, the discriminator is just saying, is this a real or fake image of a shoe? So we have this kind of draw hand-drawn shoe here and a real uh, picture of a real shoe. And those are both being generated by a, a generative network. And the discriminator is just saying, are these real? But since we already know these two are paired, then we say, oh, well we've transferred a image, a drawn image to a real image. Uh, so that had obviously limitations to it because the data set is already kind of perfectly preformatted, so we have an X and Y, and we're just running those images to a generator network to say, I mean, a discriminator network to say, are these real or fake? So in a real world where we don't have any perfect data and they're unpaired, so on the right-hand side, we needed a way to sort of find out uh, how to make new uh, images that aren't paired but still kind of transfer the style. And they use, uh, this is where CycleGAN comes in, where it actually uses uh, the unpaired data, but first we have G, so this is like your classic uh, discriminator, uh, discriminator and generator network, but then it also uses F, which is actually the inversion of that. So you can think if you want to translate a, uh, a sentence to French, and then you translate that language back to English, it should be the same, uh, and that's really what the CycleGAN uh, is testing on. So it, it uses uh, two, uh, two generators and two discriminators in this case, so G takes real images and then makes a style folder, f a photo, which is like you know a Monet style photo, uh, and then runs that to a discriminator, and the discriminator says, "Is this um, a real image or a generated image?" And then F takes that same or the style photo and runs it by the discriminator network and says, "Is this a real or generated image?" So it's kind of using, kind of backtracking in reverse, and that's why I called uh, the cycle uh, or cycle GAN because it's taking. Uh, the one production of the, the generator and then running by the discriminator again uh, to make sure that it's a real or generated photo. So those are kind of three approaches to GANs and there's a, a page called GANZOO and there's about like a hundred and plus other approaches to GANs so if you're really interested in, in that kind of stuff uh, that I would definitely recommend looking at that. I think doing some initial research in this uh, it's quite nice to have kind of the research paper as well as a, a blog or something that kind of can explain if you're not, uh, you know, in academia uh, to alongside it. And I think another great blog that uses this is a medium site called Towards Data Science, uh, which kind of really explained a lot of, um, with your know, graphs and charts, a lot of how these GANs or different approaches work and um, produce them there. Uh, but that's basically it for me. So if there's any other questions on uh, GANs and how they work? Yep. Exactly. 
Yeah, so the that's a good point. Um, so both evolved as far as uh, kind of being able to both eat, eat through their goals as far as minimizing or maximizing error. Um, so it's just, uh, I guess, as far as the evolution, you're kind of changing different parameters within their uh, of those image, either of those networks to generate or to produce uh, the either of those desired results. Uh, so that's in each network, there's different layers that uh, different parameters, and I think you might go into this a little bit as well uh, on the implementation side of things. Um, but yeah, the discriminator based on and uh, kind of going to the example of the forging, um, it knows it can pick up. Okay, well, I know based on this being fake, I can look at these labels of uh, what the generator has produced and kind of pr pr like improve my idea of what fake is, if that makes sense. So the discriminator uh, can pick up on the details knowing that it's fake based on other details and kind of add that to uh, the, the network of making decisions on what's fake and what's not. I don't have a slide about like the different layers of the networks, but I think that might be a, uh, another follow-up as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th th it all comes down to what data set that you pick for training the discriminator. Uh, but you would want a data set that you know is perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's available data sets already, so you don't have to like <laughs> do the hard work. But, that but yeah, that the data sets already kind of have a pair of text and what the correct image is. And then what happens is then the generator is actually taking what I mentioned was text embedding uh, and kind of processing the language to compare that to the actual image. And the language gets processed where uh, each of these sort of attributes, if you will, like bird, black, green, short beak, are kind of sub like transformed into zeros and zero and one based on uh, the different, different attributes there so that you can kind of return to a generator network. I need to make these changes then. But yeah, it's all about kind of making sure yeah, your data set is correct, that you have the birds and the right description. So. Yeah, yeah I, haven't, no, I haven't fully read the paper yet. I have a link uh, to here too, so and I can we can find a way to share it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. These are like all. These could all be separate talks in themselves. I just want to give you kind of like a brief of every them as well. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Uh, all right, I'll make this big and say bigger. Can be bigger. Is that too big? Is that okay? It's okay. Is it? I just don't really need to read the text. Um, thanks, Cora. So, all right. So what I'll do, I'll just go through a super quick implementation uh, using MNIST. Uh, so it won't be anything super fancy, but I really just want you guys to get the idea behind what the networks are doing. Cool. Uh, and so I don't know where I got this from, but apparently, according to Jan LeCun, adversarial training is the coolest thing since sliced bread. So I, I one more. So he really likes adversarial training. All right, cool. So just before um, I go through this, how many of you have trained a neural network? And okay, how many of you is this the first time you hear about a neural network? First time you hear about GANs? Cool. All right, so someone will take something away from me. Awesome. All right, so like Corey said, this is the super quick, simplest GAN architecture you can probably think of. And it has basically three components. You have the generator network that's generating images, right? And then you have the discriminator network, which is trying to figure out are these real or not, right? Or do they belong to this category or not? Um, and then you have um, a data set of real images. And so you're essentially comparing uh, a real image against a fake image. And the idea is you go back and forth training this, this network, the generator producing better and better images, and the discriminator getting better and getting better at discriminating between fake and real images until hopefully you uh, reach some kind of equilibrium where the discriminator is at 50-50 between uh, rejecting or accepting uh, images generated from the general network, right? And when you reach that point, it might not be perfect, um, but at least the network is, I guess, reach its capacity, right? And <coughs> now, how many of you have seen Jupyter Notebooks in the past? So this is a super standard, really easy to use, uh, kind of Python interface that you can use from your browser and you can run just about anything and it's just pretty handy for uh, pur for these purposes. Okay, so like I said, uh, we're just looking at MNIST. So MNIST is this uh, data set of handwritten uh, images, handwritten digits. And it's basically the standard uh, data set, at least it was for a long time for machine learning uh, classification and generation task. Okay. So this is super simple, very bare bones. So we're going to use TensorFlow uh, and NumPy. That's basically it. And then some random and plotting functions. Okay. So nothing out of the ordinary, very vanilla stuff, nothing too fancy. So you can just run this and it loads and then in this here we're just gonna uh, load the MNIST uh, data set which it comes pre-installed with uh, TensorFlow so you don't actually have to go and get the data or do anything with it uh, so you can just go and get it and, and that's it and if you wanted to see how big it is uh, there you go it's around uh, 55,000 or so uh, training examples uh, that we're loading here, okay? And so this is not like, it's not like high definition images, it's very uh, 28 by 28 grayscale, so it's just really simple, that's basically what they look like, right? But for kind of simple demonstration purposes, you really want these things to be as light as possible so you can actually train it and demonstrate it quickly. Cool. All right, so. The first thing we need to do is set up a discriminator network. Um, so <coughs> very simple, um, you start with some image, which in this case is grayscale, so it's 28 by 28 pixels and just one channel depth because it's just a grayscale, right? So if it was color, it would have three channels, right? And if it was like anything bigger, like a video, then it would be like, you know, more channels and so on. 
but it's very simple. Cool. And this is, let me see here. So how many of you heard of convolution before? Right, so in this case, we're gonna apply a super simple convolution on this image just to make it better. So just uh, convolution 2D, and then we're gonna do average pool. So which means from from the convolution, the from the output, we're just gonna take the average. You could do other things like max pool or something, but we're just gonna keep it simple and do average pool. Okay. All right, so let's go through that. And the discriminator network is gonna have, I guess, a number of layers within it, and it's gonna pass just from one convolution to the next, to the next, and so you have your regular network, your convolutions, you have your activation function, uh, Rayleigh standard, and your pooling um, layer, okay? So we're gonna do that a few times, all right? Um, so it's basically the component of a, of a network is just repeated layers of this. Uh, so convolution, activation, pooling, okay? And then in the end, let's see here, you have a, a final fully connected layer where you're actually asking the, um, the network, is this, uh, is this an image or is it real, yes or no, right? So it's just binary. Cool. All right. So we just have like a function. And then the generator network is slightly different. Right, so in this case, we're gonna start with noise, right? So we don't have any preconceived I idea, notion of what this is. We're just starting with, with just noise, right? And the idea is that we're gonna perform, uh, so we start with noise, and then we're gonna perform a number of convolutions or deconvolutions in this case, to actually go back and change the noise in a way so that we can pull the network. Does that make sense? So we're starting from noise, absolutely nothing, or you know, randomness, and then we're gonna fix the noise in a way so that the discriminator begins to uh, actually fail. Okay, so we go through convolution layers. Uh, in this case, it's just, uh, I guess, four layers, and then a final H convolution. And so we can actually go through this. Oh, let me see here what happened. Oh, I think I forgot to actually run this. Let's see here. One second. I just ran this like three seconds ago. So let me go back and see why I didn't. I do not run. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Already Excel. Okay. So. Oh yeah. So it should be fine then, because I already run it. So. Okay. So. That should be there. I th I think I already run it. Uh. Okay, let's uh, let's restart the kernel. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through it super quickly. And on which one you said? Ah, uh, here we go. I think you might, let's see, it takes a while. So you should run the next, you should do the next session. <laughs> so let's see here, uh, okay, okay. Where were we? Okay, so I think we get it. There we go. Yes, all right, success, thank you. And then uh, here we go. 
So it goes for iteration of that and it's just producing some noise. Okay. Uh, all right, every everyone happy with that? Yeah, I'm happy with that. Uh, okay. <laughs> so then, of course, what you want to do is just actually train the network and go back and forth until the noise begins to look like actually something useful, right? So you have you have a loss, so the loss is what actually training the network. And let me see here. So this is just the loss of real versus fake. And your final loss is the loss of real plus your loss of, of it being fake. Cool. Uh, and you're using a standard uh, atom optimizer. And you're trying to maximize, uh, minimize over that. Okay, cool. Uh, so here is the tricky thing. So the more you train this, the better it'll get. Uh, and sometimes it's kind of training, even though it's, it's simple images, it can take a while. So here I'll just run it for 30 times, just for demonstration purposes, and let's see if the noise improved. Well, a little bit. You can see there is sort of something in the middle, right? Uh, okay, and now let's see, just in the interest of time, if I were to run this 300 times. Okay. Yeah, so th the thing uh, about it is eventually you'll reach a threshold where it's pulling the discriminator and it's not necessarily giving you good images, right? Like for example, in, in those cases, training it for longer wouldn't actually improve uh, the, the network or the result. So you have to do other things like add convolutions, um, like in cycle gain or so, the extended network, or to do two different uh, discriminators and so on. Um, but yeah, so that's the idea. And there you go. So it's starting to look like something, okay? Uh, won't run any longer because we, ha we have some food, but does that give you an idea of how these things work? So it sounds very complicated, but in reality, it's really just two networks working sort of cooperatively or competitively to produce, to improve noise into something meaningful, okay? All right, uh, questions, comments? All right, cool. So I'll just upload this to the uh, GitHub um, so anyone can go and play with it. And like you said, there is the zoo, Ganzu, and there is literally hundreds of different implementations, more complicated things you can do with this stuff. All right, cool. Uh, thank you, and thank you. Okay, cool.